All right. Well, in the spirit of the Olympic Games, today's edition of At Home with the Who's is today we visit with former Virginia softball and volleyball player Megan O'Leary. But it is near the, neither softball uh, nor volleyball that will bring today's guest to the Games, the Olympic Games this summer. In fact, it is her fascinating uh, odyssey through a sport she developed later in life as a rower now on the U.S. Olympic team. So, uh, Megan, kind of you to carve out some time to be with us today. And, uh, you know, look, you, you've certainly had an interesting journey since you were a two-sport athlete at UVA. If somebody had told you while you were on grounds that you would one day participate in two Olympic Games in rowing, what do you think you would have said? <laughs> well, it's funny you say that um, because that actually happened, not to the you know exact verbatim phrase, but um, Kevin Sauer, who's the head women's rowing coach um, at UVA, he pulled me aside while I was on grounds. Uh, it was my fourth year, I believe, and said, you should come out for the rowing team. You could be an Olympian one day. Wow. And so that is sort of what planted the seed. Um, and then years later led to me going down the, the Google wormhole and finding an actual rowing club and learning, learning the sport that, right, as you said, has brought me to two Olympic Games. That, that's amazing. So what was it? I mean, what did he identify in, in you that made him think that? And, and what did you think when he said that? Yeah. So I am tall for, I mean, the rowers around me are much taller than I am sometimes, but I'm almost six foot. Um, and then, you know, as a lot of teams obviously get to, to kind of overlap when they work out, whether it's, you know, in the weight room and you're kind of passing or sharing what once used to be U-Haul, you younger athletes won't know what that is. Um, but we used to do the stadiums and the rowing team was in there and and coach Sauer could just, he could see in me that I was a workhorse. And that's what he said. He's like, you have the build for it. You're clearly a workhorse. Rowing requires and demands a lot of work. And so that was, I think he saw sort of the potential both in my physical stature, but obviously my, probably my work ethic and approach to, to my sport at the time, which was volleyball and softball, obviously. Yeah. I think when he said that too, I mean, <laughs> you know, I kind of laughed at him and I was like, that sounds amazing, but I have never heard of that sport until I came to the school. Um, so it was, you know, a little, little different reaction probably than he expected. That's amazing. So his, his coach Sauer ever forgiven you for not competing for him all these years later? You know, when I told him what was happening, when I did pick up an oar, he was like, now, now, of course, <laughs> now, um, you know, my thank you to him, as I like to say, was he, so my actual coach um, did not get to come with us to the Olympic games in 2016. She literally broke her water on the day we were leaving um, her water broke uh, for Rio. So she could not travel with us. And we had tapped Kevin, we tapped coach shower to be our coach at the Olympic games. So he actually traveled to Rio with us. And I, I said, can we call it even now? So, <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds like a pretty good deal. Pretty amazing and pretty prescient of uh, coach Sauer nonetheless, but uh, okay. So it, your entry into rowing, we mentioned it happens after college, but it didn't even start right after you got out of college. I mean, you, you were in Charlotte working for ESPN and what were you doing and how did rowing become a part of your life from that juncture forward? Yeah. So I was in Charlotte. I had started to pick up, you know, CrossFit was becoming a thing. Um, this was years ago and I was getting on the, in the rowing machine and I was decent and kind of um, you know, beating several of the guys in the class at the time. And uh, when I, I got a promotion and moved from Charlotte up to Connecticut, that was when I, you know, the following summer, I remember being like, you know what, I want to be outside. Um, I should, I should try rowing. You know, it's New England. This is where the sport is kind of its tradition. Um, and that's what, you know, that's what led me into it was simply, you know, hey, I'd, I'd kind of fooled around on the, the stationary erg and then had in the back of my mind, you know, Kevin Sauer saying like, Hey, you, you have the potential to be good at this. And there I was clicking away, finding learn to row classes. That's an amazing story. So <laughs> with something like this, it, it's an acquired skill, I'm sure. And, and, and there's a learning curve associated with it, but did you fall in love with it immediately? Or was it kind of an acquired taste for you? I mean, I definitely fell in love with it very early on. Um, I like to tell the story that I almost didn't even show up to the first class because I was so terrified because it was something so foreign to me. You know, I, I was an athlete since I remember, but mostly ball sports, you know, I did high jump and so that, but this was something, it was on the water. It was, it was often singular, you know, you're often your own single and um, singularly focused. So it was very foreign to me and that in initially scared me. But then I do think that part of it is what drew me in. It was like, it was so different and kind of unlocked and unleashed a part of me that I hadn't discovered playing these other sports. And so it was an immediate, it was a pretty immediate, you know, kind of falling in love and, 
you talk to any rower and they they talk about the addiction <laughs> that the sport can can kind of provide to you in terms of just you know the fluidity and the there is a beauty to the sport as well so I definitely fell in love early yeah uh so, so tell us is let's get into the Olympic Games side of this now tell us about your role on Team USA and what races are you going to be participating uh with in Japan yeah so rowing is is similar to you know maybe track and field and swimming and that there are different events um and with that there's different boat classes so it's rare it's very very rare to double up um but I will be representing this year uh, I'm a member of the women's quad, so the women's quadruple skulls. Um, in Rio, I was in the women's double, so it's a discipline of sculling versus sweep. I am definitely in the sculling discipline, um, but I'm excited to be in the boat with three other incredible athletes to, to make up the women's quad. Yeah, that's outstanding. So this will be your second uh, Olympics, as we mentioned, and I want to get into how different this one could be from the last one in a moment. But you rode for for team, or you rode for uh, yeah, at Team USA back in 2016 in Rio. And uh, I, I, as I understand, your team had a huge upset of the two-time world champs in that event in, from New Zealand in the semifinals, and they had a rough day in the finals. Describe what that experience was like for you. Man, the highest of highs and then the lowest of lows. <laughs> um, but that semifinal was, was absolutely sort of when you think about and dream about having an Olympic moment, um, being able to just, you know, go flat out and have a, you know, sort of the performance of a lifetime that semifinal and coming through the the two-time world champions, as you said, New Zealand and Olympic gold favorite to knock them out. It was incredible. And it was, it was something that, you know, I still get chills kind of thinking about because it was that moment where you, you work so hard to be able to test yourself in that way. And, and we were able to, to do that and, you know, achieve this, this pretty amazing thing to turn around two days later and have a really disappointing race. You know, we just, it was, it was really rough water and, you know, weather and, we had a, unfortunately, like a pretty bad lane, an outside lane, um, as they call it, that had the roughest water. And we just, we struggled, you know, you hit one wave and once it slows you down, it's really hard uh, to get brought back up to speed. So a little bit of a, just, you know, a bad taste in your mouth after you have such a, a incredible performance and you feel like you're able to put it all out there. Whereas again, two days later in the final, you, you have a more disappointing one. Yeah. And now you've got this opportunity to go at it again. I mean, I got to think something like that fuels you. And this will be a different experience, I guess, as we should preface the fact that we're having this conversation from your home in Princeton, New Jersey, before you go uh, to travel overseas to, to get out there. But what, what are you expecting from this this year's experience? And, and how much are you fueled by that previous experience you had? Yeah, so this experience will be different in a lot of ways. Um, the COVID Olympics will be will be like no other, and you know, in so many ways. And you know, we're we're we as you do, you go over to focus on competition, but then there's a lot of surrounding things that make the Olympics the Olympics. That will not be the case this year. It's going to be a very, um, you know, a very, <laughs> a very isolated. You know, you're you're either at the competition venue or you're in your room at the athlete village, um, and you know, you're in a few days before your competition starts. You're out 48 hours after, um, so it'll be different. Um, and then, you know, what I think what fueled me to keep going was I feel like I had unfinished business. I knew, you know, my partner and I in 2016 had beaten every medalist, and we knew what we were capable of, um, and. You know, I think too. There's there's other kind of history with with women's sculling in in the U.S. and, and it's sometimes treated as sort of this like secondary second class thing. And we really wanted to to demonstrate that hey, we can you know we can win medals and and this can be a first class event. Um, so I'm really excited to to kind of use that as fuel. And we have we've we've been putting down some fast times, and we're excited and think we have real metal potential uh, going into these games. After Tokyo, uh, wh where do you set your sights? What's next? Yeah, so I mean, it's funny. People are like, "You're retiring." I'm like, "I'm old. <laughs> it's time. My body is is quitting on me. I will never." I mean, I'm an athlete at heart. I think I I've already gotten into, you know. Um, pretty, pretty long rides and cycling and, and see myself getting competitive in that just to, to fuel, fuel the uh, competitive edge that, that will not go away. Um, I, you know, I've been working for the majority of the time that I've been training. I, again, I, I was with ESPN and then left to focus more full-time, but then over the last six, seven years have, I co-founded a tech startup, um, left them recently, but that sort of also, you know, enlightened me to my enjoyment of, you know, working in, in tech and business. And I, I've started to entertain some ideas um, and, you know, opportunities that'll, 
it'll probably land somewhere around that. But I'm definitely taking my time <laughs> in terms of figuring out what exactly what I want to do. Who knows? Maybe I'll go back to ESPN. We'll see. Yeah, I was going to say, so should we, should we be looking for either the 2024 Olympic Games as a cyclist now? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. But, uh, <laughs> you know, finally, with, with your particular journey, um, what would you tell our viewers about pursuing their own dreams? I mean, it's worth it, right? I mean, I think what keeps us from pursuing um, our dreams is, is most often uh, our fears of whether it's fear of, you know, uh, not achieving it or fear of being embarrassed, fear of failing, that sort of thing. And for me, I, you know, I learned so much about myself on this journey because I, I kind of, I had to just throw that out the window. I had to fail and fail miserably <laughs> in order to learn. Um, and it was worth it. You know, I, I, I think that, you know, it's, that's the biggest, what I've learned is the biggest hurdle is to kind of get past yourself when, when setting out for big dreams and aspiring to big things, but you know, it's, it's worth it. Well, that's a great story. And, uh, I'll tell you, Megan, we appreciate you so much carving some time to be with us again here today. And thanks so much, uh, for, for your time and good luck to you as you continue on this magical ride that you've embarked on. Yeah. Thanks so much. Have, have a good one. All right, we'll, we'll do. And again, that is Megan O'Leary. We'll be continuing on with our At Home with the Who's segments. We'll be picking things up next week, so we hope you check in right here on virginiasports.com.